Hi, welcome back to the Dylan Rounds case. Welcome if you're currently here in the live premiere, I appreciate it. Today, we're gonna to be looking back at the comments of last night's video as well, more importantly, looking at a big red flag regarding James Brenner at a time of when Heavy D and his crew were in the area doing that flyby as we'll be sharing the footage from the documentary once again, and I'll be tying it in with my own analysis on that. James Brenner acting a little bit suspicious, hiding, possibly lurking within his trailer at the time. And I do have a photo to prove that. And, you know, it's kind of like another observation by me, which I came out with before the documentary aired live public. So we can tie it all together today and you can share your thoughts on the matter. More like the body language of Brenner at the time interpreted as suspicious or intrigued and try and come to a conclusion. As we go throughout this video, be sure to share your thoughts, opinions, reactions, and talk about a range of other stuff in the chat on the right-hand side of the screen. If you haven't already checked out my previous video, I will provide a link down below, along with some other links if you wish to view them, okay? As for last night, it was once again relatively under control, did a live stream as well. That was done a bit earlier in a, in a way, which was practical in the end, um, slept better. Maybe tonight's video could be a bit shorter, but it all works out for the sleep patterns and that's what's most important. We can look back at the previous comments to allow those to join on in right now, okay? Answer any questions, see if there's any additional information that needs to be looked at, analyzed, as well, looks like, and you can tell by from the title, there's an individual who's not too amused or pleased with me at this moment in time, and that is Kurt Wadsworth, or supposedly Kurt Wadsworth. He did leave a comment on my last video. We can read that out today and see what he's got to say. Okay, let's head on over right now. I'm just gonna arrange the comments to the newest. As I said, not really got too many to get through, but you know, a bit more chunkier the comments though, what's present. Wasn't able to fit everything in the title, so I included it in the description instead. True, that's what I have to do at times. Um, YouTube limits the characters in titles. You just gotta do what you gotta do, right? We got Beatriz there. Uh, two lots of comments, but that's all good. Saying, Warlight Raf, you got this. You're simply the best covering this case concerning Dylan Rounds and all your other topics. Appreciate that. It's good of Beatrice to acknowledge the other cases and coverage of different videos. So Beatrice is a good individual right there. Got Glenn once again. Shout out to Glenn. There's Kurt Wadsworth's comment. We'll get to that in a second. Uh, and then here's this person, Joe Senat saying salty crew now has 1000 plus subscribers but most of his videos have less than 100 views ha 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 what a joke salty you are so dumb and fake so what we've seen here the channel buying views or buying subscribe well in, in this case buying subscribers why i don't know to make it appear that this, the channel looks more established than it really is um, I mean, it wouldn't surprise me just in general on YouTube, you will get people out there that will have lots of views or considerably a high subscriber count and you wonder why. Is that, does that even make sense? When it doesn't make sense, it's likely because it's not natural. Um, it does seem weird going from what, 400 subscribers as it was a few days ago up to a thousand and yet the views don't change much. Um, you know, like in the early stages of growing a channel, you probably will have more views than subscribers. And then eventually the subscribers start building and maybe the views do as well. But eventually you, you get to that point that's like down the line where you might have more subscribers than viewers. That is normal um, down the line. Immediately, though, more su subscribers than viewers, that does seem a bit odd. Unless, I mean, there's times on YouTube where you'll get channels out there, random ones, 
and could have about 15,000 subscribers, 32,000, 163,000 subscribers, and have got zero content on their channel. That I, I don't understand that. I don't know why that happens. You've also got the other channels on YouTube, which will have one to two videos, Minecraft or Roblox videos, with maybe about fifty to 100,000 views on each one. And as for the subscriber count, maybe about three to 400,000 subscribers. And what those channels do is just go about on YouTube leaving positive comments or motivational comments. You know, like, oh, I wish you all the luck in the world. Or, oh, remind yourself that you are just fine as you are because you're beautiful. They'll post something like that on all different types of videos out there. And obviously some will relate to it and others will think, oh, that's such a nice thing to say. Let me subscribe to you. It's a load of BS. It's like bot-like behavior, but it's real people. And they're doing it for one reason. Act nice, appear positive, be in favor and gain statistically, right? When it comes to other channels out there that make videos on drama, negativity, that's what fuels them, that's what helps with their growth. Different, you know, elements at play there, depending on the situation and the environment you're in. But that's just at least my observations from the background on YouTube. Kind of, you know, at times it, it just doesn't make sense. You will get the the odd few channels out there which will produce a high-end, high-quality, maybe cinematic or documentary-style video, and they might only have about three to 600 subscribers, but the video itself is beyond high quality. And then you get the people leaving comments on there and saying, oh my, how, how do you have so little subscribers? You deserve many more. You deserve 100,000 subscribers. And, you know, sometimes you see it in the early stages, it can end up leading to that down the line and growing like that. Other times you'll see videos and channels where people leave comments saying, wow, you deserve a million subscribers and it will never happen. So it, it just depends, right? The only way you can ensure the chance, the possibilities of getting um, 100,000 subscribers or 10 million views is by continuing on YouTube. It's the only way, right, to ensure the chance of hitting that point. I mean, just out of um, interest, it would be crazy if one day you upload a short video and then you wake up the next day or you look at your phone 10 hours later and then suddenly you got 500,000 views on that video. Sure, you don't get much out of it because short videos, they're not going to really do much there. But in terms of traffic and maybe gaining subscribers, that'd be just kind of fun to look at. You know, when you look at it visually, something that's visually satisfying or visually pleasing, to come across that, it's like a surprise, you know, especially if you're not expecting it. You just upload a video, not expecting much to come out of it, and then you check back later and you think, wow. And it, it, it can vary, right? If you just started your channel up or you just don't really do much on your channel and then you randomly upload a video... And then you get about 1,000 to 5,000 views. Even that is quite exciting, right? Even though my channel, I've got about 8.2 thousand subscribers. Am I getting 8,000 plus people watching the videos? No. Do I expect that? No, I don't expect that. It's normal, that. But even if I uploaded a short video now and I got about 2,000 views on it, I'd be quite happy with that, Okay. Maybe my standards are kind of low, but then at the same time, I'm trying to be as realistic as possible. You get what I'm saying? Maybe if I try to develop the mindset more often with videos thinking, right, this is going to be explosive, this is going to hit hard, then maybe that's what the outcome will be. But then I feel like it's just like with my predictions in the Dylan Rounds case. If I did it so often, then maybe you would lose that touch. Maybe it wouldn't be as meaningful anymore and it wouldn't actually work. Sometimes things happen every now and then because it's meant to be and um, it's more impactful. If it happens all the time, it loses its um, special touch. Anyway, that was a, a long detour in that comment by Joe Sennett. Let's see what Kurt Wadsworth's got to say here. Bit of a long comment. Here we go. So... He says, hey, Warlight Raph, 
don't want to call you out too much by name. Dude, you're so effing special. Ah, so I assume when being labelled as special, that means having special needs, possibly disabled. Okay. In your own little effing world, doing all these 365 plus videos you brag about. I mean, the last time I checked, making an observation, pointing out a fact. I didn't think that acquainted to bragging, but I guess people interpret it differently. What are you really doing to solve a case of my very close friend and associate, Dylan Rounds? Your own little pea brain mind being thousands of miles away. What the F? Reminds me of when Dip F. Jim Terry, for sure, an ADD patient, so-called private investigator, rang my phone number asking my name and if I knew Mr. Dylan Rounds, of which was about to be a big part by contract to be a part to play in his dream would only be proper. What are you on about? He, Dylan, shared to me every reason to make me want to sign. Next question, do you know Dylan Rounds? I'm thinking, yeah, I do. Jim Terry, do you know he is gay? He likes older men. Silence on my part at time. OF, I said in my mind, dude, what the hell? He is not gay. And if he was, he never put moves on me. And I'm that older man, mother, F. I'm 63. F, you calling me gay? And I slammed my phone down and hung up. We call that an investigator. What the F? Same as you. What the F? Right. So depending how it's been worded in the background, Jim Terry having a call with Kurt Wadsworth and it's been very successful and very deep and fulfilling as other people have muttered. And then Kurt Wadsworth here calls Jim Terry out, calling him an invest a private investigator. What a sorry excuse. So even Kurt Wadsworth is calling out Jim Terry. Doesn't really approve of him. Interesting. Right. There seems to be, over time, a little bit of associating, but done in a false way. Just the odd few people with time have labelled me or said that I'm similar to Jim Terry in certain ways. Kind of random, but... You know, people have their own little observations, not that they're successful, right? Let's just check what the responses are, and then we'll go back over this comment, all right? Smooth Fisher. He is covering the case, not trying to solve it. If you can't figure that out, you're not very smart, which I could tell by your comment. I'd have thought after 63 years old, you would have learned the English language by now. <laughs> and Christy saying... You could simply thank Warlight Raff for still covering Dylan's case after everybody else stopped doing it. You should respect him for the work he is doing, covering every single aspect of this story in a very humble, organised and intelligent way. If you feel triggered by his videos in some way, it's probably because you should work more on yourself to become more balanced and relaxed with life. You are leading. So um, it's, it's good of Christy and Smooth Fishing to say what they said um, against this resistance i appreciate that so first of all he says i don't want to call you out too much is that him being serious or being a bit cocky i guess it depends it also depends was kurt wadsworth sober or drunk at the time of typing this comment in i mean it makes a bit more sense this time round compared to his last comment so there's a bit of improvement so first of all, he says, Warlight Raff is so special. Well, thank you. Much appreciated there. I know in brackets, special can mean other things. I'm aware of that. In your own little world. That's um, doing all these 365 videos bragging about it. So I think what Kurt Wadsworth is implying here is that I'm supposedly bragging just like how Jim Terry brags about stuff because of that repetitive language. You know, when I do my videos, I'll say, oh, and here's my 365th, my 370th video, etc. 
It's because it's an announcement, it's a milestone, it's to highlight the importance of the coverage of the case by repetitively stating and factually stating it with statistics that this is the numbered video we're on now. It speaks volume, it shows that the case has depth, there's a lot of understanding to get from it, right? You understand that, Kurt? Because there'll be other cases out there which may have gone cold and dead, faded away quickly. And people that may have covered it only may have produced just a couple of videos, right? you got to understand in some way or another, whether it applies to you or other people more so out there, that the amount of videos produced by a singular channel is a way of acknowledging as well the other people out there who've shared and, you know, come up with their own material and uh, thoughts and shared it between one another and, you know, reinforced it and counted it and discussed it, opened up all kinds of different pathways, right? So, really, the, the amount of videos, the higher the amount of videos made the higher the significance of the case and the depth behind it. It's simple as, right? But obviously you don't understand that. Um, so once again, saying that very close, my very close friend and associate, Dylan Rounds. So you can see it's definitely Kurt Wadsworth here, if you didn't already know. Obviously last time around, people uh, were saying this wasn't Kurt Wadsworth and it's like, well, what more, what more behavioral uh, analysis do you need? You know, you just, look, you just look at the wording, the language, and you, you can pick up on it pretty quick, right? Being thousands of miles away. Yeah? And? What does that matter? So, reminds me of Jim Terry, for sure. An ADD patient. You mean ADHD or something? I'm not sure. So this part was just like a little story, but wasn't it, to do with his encounter with Jim Tay, more so in recent time. Weezer, as well, was contacted by Jim Terry in recent time. I think it was to do with, have you seen Kurt Wadsworth recently? See, this is the thing. All these characters out there getting called left, right, and centre, where do these phone numbers get passed about to begin with? Should we start a little discussion now? You know, all these people have the the phones called by a certain somebody in the case, and it's like, who got your phone number to begin with? Who passed it on? And I think Weezer was saying that it was Ty Corbin that passed her phone number onto Jim Terry. Would it surprise me? No. See, this is what I mean. This is the dodgy side of when you start exchanging phone numbers with one another, right? Sometimes text-based conversations and messages are more practical, less messy. Once a phone number is passed around, it's endless. You get what I'm saying? And depending if it's if it falls into the wrong hands, you could get some unwanted attention and further harassment down the line, especially if you annoy people. You get prank calls. You get all kinds of dodgy people calling on in. So if there's anyone in the chat right now or any Montello locals in the background, just be cautious, just be wary of when it comes to exchanging phone numbers with other people out there because those other people out there may pass it on to somebody else and so on, so on. And does that help the case? No, not really. Hmm. And going about things at times third party, the back end route sounds dodgy as well. Okay. Anything else? The whole gay theory has been pretty much an obsession throughout time with some people out there. Right. Have you never put moves on me? I'm that older man, right? F you calling me gay. I slammed my phone down. We call that an investigator. What the fuck? Same as you. Right. So, um,. At the end of this comment, it's as if Kurt Wadsworth is saying that I'm an investigator as well. I mean, I've clearly explained several times by now how I go about covering such as the Dylan Rounds case, keeping it alive. Keeping it alive enables it not to die out. Because if it did die out, then where do people talk about it? People, out others out there would just forget and think, oh, that's it, game over and move on. 
yeah, it, it just wouldn't work. It, it wouldn't go down well. It'd be pretty bad. That's what I'm saying. You know, at the start, when I came in, I didn't say, right, I'm going to find Dylan Rounds immediately. I'm going to go here. I'm going to... I didn't over-promise. Arguably, under-promised, over-delivered. Right? That's what it's all about. Anyway, there's Kurt Wadsworth. Bit impetuous. But he's, he's also calling out Jim Terry as well in his comment, right? So that aside, I mean, it's now time to move on with the video. So regarding Heavy D and the first early red flag warning in his mindset was to do with James Brenner on site, on property of the grain shed, right? In his trailer or maybe outside of his trailer, depending what angle Heavy D got at the time. And this is dating back to what? Well, the video was uploaded June the 9th, 2022. Now, videos can be uploaded the following day after. So maybe it would have to have been between June the 3rd to June, let's say, the 8th. That's when I think Heavy D was actually down there present. It could apply to June the 5th because of that flyby over of the wash. If that ties in line with Heavy D and his crew coming on down on the same day. Basically, it's really early on in the case, right? Just after Dylan Rounds has been reported missing and just after the spring cleaning by Brenner inside of the grain shed property. Hence why when you've seen the footage of Heavy D flying on over, the grain truck being left out of the grain shed and never parked back in. And that was done by Brenner, right? I mean, just that moment, right? I think, do you know what? Can we just mention something very quick before we go any further? I mean, with the reports in the past, in the, at the start, that the grain truck had DNA from Dylan, Brenner, and Don Hatley. Well, because they all operate at some point. Yeah. What, could it be used against anyone? No. That's not how it went. The fact that there was police present, though, and an officer, too, present on June the 2nd, witnessing Brenner getting into the grain truck and driving it out. That... Even if those ideas and points are true in the background by the likes of Corey, Kurt Wadsworth, etc., that it was Brenner that took the grain truck to the grain shed and parked it in for whatever reason, that that doesn't really mean anything anymore because that additional DNA afterwards, few days on, post Dylan's death and disappearance, June 2nd, spring cleaning, police witness Brenner get into the grain truck touch the wheel, move it about. So then when there's like a DNA test, forensics upon the truck afterwards, of course Brenner's DNA is going to appear on it because he was driving it June the 2nd out of the grain shed, right? And the police saw it as well. And in their mindset, kind of oddly, not strange, not out of the blue, just normal. You get what I'm saying? Two... Possibly two lots of times Brenner operating the grain truck. First time round in the process of Dylan's death. Very dodgy, very suspicious. But then the second time round, the second time round overlaps and overshadows the first time round because it's after, you know, the death, days later. So it's basically possibly DNA overlapping previous DNA on different days making the previous lot of DNA invalid and irrelevant. Did Brenner do that on purpose, though? I don't know. Makes you think. Anyway, I just wanted to point that out. Just let me know your thoughts down below. But returning back to Heavy D, early June, down there with his crew, interviewing Candice Cooley and her new husband, as well as doing the flyby over, grain shed property and other areas too, like Dylan's farm. But it was mentioned in the documentary most recently when Heavy D was flying over the, the grain shed property and near to Brenner's trailer that Brenner appeared as if he was trying to hide from the helicopter or appears as if he didn't notice it despite the helicopter being low down and being noisy. Heavy D stating that in the past when he's been elsewhere people would react and wonder what's going on. But it's as, if, it's as if Brenner was purposely acting different. Could that be seen as a red flag, as Heavy D has stated? Well, we can look at a photo shortly to prove that point, okay? Or at least to reinforce it, right? 
I think first of all, what I'll do is just play that short clip to you from the words of Heavy D himself from that Dylan Rounds documentary. Just a short portion. I'll play it to you so it's word for word. And then there's a few photos to analyse after that. And then I'll play to you the original footage of Heavy D and the flyby back in the past and then analyse that photo where it all comes to a head. Hopefully you understand that. Let's pre proceed onwards with the documentary footage. We flew over to the grain shed, which was the area where Jim had been squatting, where Dylan was, you know, last seen. And as we flew low around the grain shed, Jim acted like we weren't there. He pretended like he couldn't see us. I've flown helicopters for a lot of years, and never once have I flown over somebody who doesn't look up. Now, I don't know if that's because Jim was just, uh, you know, an old man who was fed up with all these people being in his area where, you know, he normally has a lot of privacy, or if he was trying to play it cool. And that, to me, was something that, you know, it was a red flag for sure. So the first image from that documentary scene, the Grain Shed property, appears to be taken at a different date. Now, is it more recent this, 2023 or back in 2022? The movement of it implies it's some kind of drone with a steady movement, right? Not much shaking either. Does anyone else agree? I mean, wouldn't surprise me. Over time, family going out there and additional crews. Other people may have seen it at a point and thought, I wonder who they are. Or I wonder what it's all about. Some kind of search taking place. Or the crew in assisting recording the documentary, right? I mean, I think there was a scene either at the start or towards the end of the part two documentary of Dylan Rounds where Candice Cooley has stood there on the property or nearby holding a, a photo up of Dylan Rounds. She's got a woolly hat on as well. I don't know how cold it was at the time, but there was that. I mean, could that imply it was winter time? Well, no, the ground, I didn't see any snow on the ground. But this is the thing, right? First of all, you always ask yourself, how many times have people been out there searching for Dylan, such as the family or private search teams? And then on top of that, you could ask yourself, out of those times out there, how much of it was searching for Dylan? And then how much of it was recording for the documentary, right? I know people have said, is the documentary inappropriate for the timing because Dylan's not been found yet? Yeah, I understand that. But the overall message of the documentary, although lacking severely in certain areas, it was just more of a summary of events leading up to Dylan's disappearance and death, and then what followed afterwards. The negatives by the LE, the missed opportunities, well, some of them at least, etc. That's just um, how it was at the time. So, was it the best? No. But for someone that wants maybe a brief catch-up on the case, I guess it's good enough, right? Hmm. I mean, I'm just, I'm just observing this photo right now. I just want to know your thoughts on it. Was the provenance, the date of it? When was it taken? When was this footage conducted? I mean, you got to look at, you got to look for key things, you know, in the image. What stands out? Yeah, you got the grain shed property. We could even zoom on in. Grain shed property there. The toilet outside the portaloo. Um, on the right there, hopefully you can see. Far hand right side. You got the backhoe present. Still not been moved. Bob Farrell says that there's bullet holes in the back of the, the backhoe tyre. Once again, is that BS? If it was bullet holes... Who did it? It's just like the whole repeat story of Brenner's burnt down trailer back in Montello. That on one side, people were saying it was accidental, Candice Cooley and others and Justin Rounds. And then there was other groups of people out there, maybe Pancakes and others, where it was suggesting that someone went up to the trailer and shot at it and that's what caused the explosion. You know what I'm saying? There's always like opposing points. Why though? Why is that the case? Anything else? Well, you got Brenner's little shed down there. Very tiny shed. You see on the ground. That's where some uh, items were, like the saddles and stuff to do with horses and a bit of rope. And then a bit more to the left are some cars, stairs. 
don't know who it belongs to. But you can clearly see, oh, as well, you know that little black object there, centre of the screen? That's the burn barrel, if you didn't already know. I believe that's the burn barrel. And then just past that would have been where the trailer of Brenner's was, but it's not, it's not here because it was taken away. It was taken away in the, the early days. Anything else of interest? I believe Lucin Hill is over that way on screen. Bald Eagle Mountain over there. And then more to the left off camera would be Pilot Peak. The Dirt Mound, I believe the Dirt Mound is there. It's kind of hard to see from this angle. The only thing I have noticed, look at those track marks. Correct me if I'm wrong, if that, if that isn't the Dirt Mound. It's just because it kind of stands out a little bit. But what are those track marks, man? There's a couple of them. Track marks there, going off to the left, fading out. And the more prominent ones here. You see those two lines parallel to one another? Going over that way, up to the Dirt Mound. So it just depends when this footage was taken, right? If it was more recent, then you could say, well, why is the track marks leading up to the dirt mound when it's already been checked in the past and cleared? As said, I'm only just pointing out, you know, items and things, what I see on screen or stuff that is no longer present because it might provide an understanding and explanation of when this was actually taken. And if anyone does know, feel free to list it down below. Okay. So as said, the Dylan Rounds documentary, there was material, photos shared and used in it. Some of which, more to do with Dylan and the past of Dylan, were posted on Find Dylan Rounds Facebook page in the past, right? I've already seen them. And I'm sure some of you have too. As for additional footage, a little bit here, a little bit there, to do with Dylan's truck and inside trailer portion of that was used what about the footage by Candice Cooley walking around the either Dylan's farm or grain shed property and noticing footprints on the ground that wasn't used that wasn't used in the documentary and I've hardly seen that footage may have seen it once or twice but the video quality was really poor right and you know if you're out there trying to get hold of track marks footprints and show it take a photo video record it you want the best quality, right? Because sometimes they can be a bit obscured within the ground, the prints. So you need the best quality. And uh, that wasn't really the case at the time. But I guess probably had an older phone, so you're limited to what you can do with it. Anyway, that's some of the footage, what you see on the screen of uh, the area of Lucin, Green Shed property. Next photo, if there is one, there we go, was when it was introducing Jim Brenner, also known as James Brenner, known as Dylan's neighbour, okay? Now, some of you probably will be familiar of this image, right? This was one of the first and really only images of James Brenner outside of prison, outside of jail, right? In the early days when James Brenner was announced as a potential suspect, uh, we saw it on the official news reports where they were showing Brenner for the first time way back then. And it was more zoomed in, if you remember. That was Brenner in his blue jacket, blue clothing, his cap, which at the time we thought, was it a John Deere one? Was it stolen from Dylan Rounds? But in the end, it turned out that this photo was taken at a different time. I don't know if this is taken way back in the past or after Dylan's death. I'm not too sure there. Obviously, he's got his beard at the time. Um, but I guess the interesting thing is with this photo, it's zoomed out. When we looked at it in the past, the first time round, first photo of Brenner, it was zoomed in. So you didn't get the background shot. And it's quite important. Because obviously when you zoom on out, you got like a stone wall there, I think. Unless it's sandbags. It's either sandbags or a stone wall piled on top of one another. Um, but what's going on in the background there? Is this in Montello, Nevada? Or is this loose in Utah? Does anyone know? If anyone can explain, that would be appreciated. Um, not that this is the case, but sometimes if someone has a favourite spot, 
or they may have documented it in the past, they may return back to it for some reason, such as disposing of Dylan Rounds. It's like Kenny Veach. Kenny Veach went missing, and you look back at his footage just to see maybe he might have gone back to this one spot, and that's where you could find him. Just possibilities and thoughts, ideas. But if anyone knows this location, feel free to explain. I mean, I'm just trying to think, do you know when it came to uh, Don Hatley and we're looking at older photos of him? Why... I'm probably wrong, but why does this remind me of Don Hatley's place? And I don't mean his trailer. I mean, way back in the past when he was younger. But then again, it probably wouldn't match up. It wouldn't match up at all because if it, if it was Don Hatley's and he was younger back then when the photo was taken, then Brenner here, Brenner would have to appear much younger as well, and he, he doesn't. So unless Brenner was at Don Hatley's former place and took a photo outside of it. My question is, who took the photo of Brenner? Does anyone know who took the photo of Brenner here? Was it Dylan Rounds? Was it Don Hatley? Was it some other stranger in the past? Because I can't imagine Brenner putting it on a tripod and then setting the camera on timer. Can't imagine that. How old was Brenner here? Maybe, maybe 50 plus years old, 55, 58. So I just don't know the location. I expect it to be either Lucen, Utah or Montello, Nevada. That's about it, really. It looks like there could be a bit of a road over that way. There appears to be like a little shelter by the front of the building. What about the windows? Well, that window, is that boarded up? One of the panels looks like it's filled in um, in some way. Unless that's like curtains, blinds on the other side. It's painted pretty blue. It doesn't look that abandoned. The building, it's, uh, the roof looks pretty good as well. Two windows on the back. Anything in the distance where well, you've got some mountains, but I can't really work what mountains they are. Bit of vegetation on the ground. Over there appears to be a burn barrel. That's what it looks like. I don't know if it's for cooking or just burning trash. Is that burn barrel still there to this day? Wherever the location is. Side of the building too. Yeah. I don't know if it gives much away. Um, if anyone has seen this building before and knows the location, feel free to provide coordinates down below or the name of the area. And then we can follow on from there. Okay. So what we're going to do now is return back to Brenner on the day when Heavy D and the crew were present in the helicopter, play that footage to explain more about that documentary red flag, and then we can analyse the next photo. Are you ready? So here is a still screenshot from that footage of Heavy D. By the way, I, I will credit Heavy D's channel username down below in the comments section if you wish to check his videos out. Hopefully there's no copyright issues, of course, just using very small clips, including it in my own unique, uh, what do you call it, commentary video upon that. So we just briefly point out what's present here if people aren't familiar with it. Somewhere down there, the dirt mound, although it doesn't seem to show up that well on screen here, unless it's because of the angling. Um, it's probably easier to see when you're actually on ground level. Things that are no longer present, though. That truck, that's no longer present. That was taken away at some point. I don't know who it belongs to, but it was taken away. Um, I believe that still remains. Ed Hoshbarger's former trailer... RV, mobile home, which Brenner supposedly slept in at a certain point in time. Was that coinciding with his trailer being burnt down and then moving on to Lucen afterwards? Um, maybe. I mean, previous when the trailer was burnt down in Montello, supposedly Brenner stayed with Kurt Wadsworth for a little bit. So you kind of see people looking out for one another, but maybe in Brenner's case, it's more one-sided. People looked out and helped Brenner. Brenner never really returned the favour. That's how it seems to appear. 
a few loose bits and bobs out and about. As for that, like, roller, I guess it's still there. It's just the camera angles of what we saw beforehand of the area. It only showed so much. Grain truck, as you see there. See the track marks just behind it. This, as I said, was captured just after June the 2nd and between June 3rd and June the 8th, I would say, when the crew were down there. Grain truck left out because of uh, Brenner, right? Was the backhoe present? No. The backhoe wasn't present at this point, at this time, at least. So that definitely just goes to show that, once again, that the footage in the documentary hovering over was different to the Heavy D footage of his own. Because one has the backhoe, the other one doesn't. The one that doesn't have the back care was earlier imagery, right? You got that tank down there, which I believe it was rolled further down or something, moved slightly at a later point because they were checking the trenches. Shout out to that individual that did that mapping and a uh, little uh, like analysis about it, of the things being dug out and checked. Trailer over there. That little shed still remaining. That black burn barrel, which I pointed out earlier, next to those two cars, all remaining. And then Brenner's trailer there, which is no longer present. Now, what I want to do for this next part is zoom in back on that trailer, right? But I want to use the magnifying glass so we maintain image quality overall. Does that make sense? I'll just have to activate it now. Give me a second. There we go. That should be enough. And basically I can just drag it around, okay? So the rest of the image remains. So this is what we're focusing in, the trailer, the red flag. So, when Heavy D was saying how James Brenner at the time appeared not to react in any way to the helicopter looming over, well, depends, right? It's as if Heavy D noticed Brenner for Brenner to not pay much attention or to appear as if he was busy. Unless Heavy D is literally saying that Brenner was inside of the trailer at the time and he made no effort whatsoever to get out of the trailer to look up at the sky. But I'm sure there'd be many other people out there in this world that when they may see or hear a helicopter, they might not go outside because they might be tied up, they might be busy, they might be stuck on the toilet like watch her crazy. I know, it could be many reasons. I guess being in such an enclosed space, you could be surprised as to why Brenner didn't pop his head out because how often would a helicopter fly over and fly that low? Is someone visiting? Is someone infiltrating the area? What's happening? But maybe the reason why Brenner didn't do much or react is because he knew what was up. He knew what was going to follow next. So he just got on with his things without a care in the world or trying to convince himself that he's innocent by acting normal. But then by acting normal, and not curious as to what's going on around, it can be interpreted by Heavy D as trying to lay low. I get that. But as I said, previously, previously when I looked at this photo and I had to zoom on in, I picked up on it on the spot, that when you zoom in onto this trailer, right, can you see that door? Can you see that door that it appears... It appears like it's half open or slightly open. As for the windows, they appear to be, you know, open. Not open in that sense, but like there's no curtains or blinds over them. They're not concealed. And the door as well. Now, to be fair, I think what we need to do is actually zoom in a bit closer because I don't think this is good enough. I'm going to get a zoomed in image of this itself and then apply the magnifying glass. It may look a bit pixelated, but it's necessary. Give me a second. So this is the best I could do without it getting too pixelated. You can clearly see the door at the front. And if you look around the edge 
of the door opening, you can see a gap. You can see the darkness, shadows from within. That would imply that it's half open. You look at the top, on top of the door, there's a fair gap, meaning that possibilities Brenner was peeking around the door when the helicopter was flying over because at this angle the helicopter is in parallel to the side of the trailer. So if James Brenner peeked his head round the side of that door as you see with that gap he could have had a little look outside to see what the helicopter was doing and what it was up to. Would it be enough for someone like Heavy D to notice? Maybe not because like when you zoomed out you don't pick up on it. You have to zoom in, physically zoom in to notice. Maybe, and we didn't see enough footage to confirm it, but if the door opened to begin with and then shut afterwards, you saw movement, then it would further reinforce and confirm that someone was behind the door of the trailer and they were peeking outside, which was James Brenner at the time. And this is the thing, I guess that's what highlights the suspicious behaviour. Put aside um, Heavy D and his points, the red flag would be if you see a helicopter flying over and you're interested in it, you're going to pop your head out of the window or you're going to walk outside of your house or trailer, look up at the helicopter and just see what's it doing, where it's going and maybe even take a photo, record it, right? Though... When when would you start peeking through a window or peeking around the door when the presence of potential police or just an unmarked helicopter is flying over at the time? Well, you tend to peek because you've been a bit sneaky, being a bit sly, scouting, trying to take a look without being detected. Why would you not want to be detected? Maybe because you've feel guilty for something or you think that the reason why the helicopter is present is because it's got something to do with what you've done or created so you kind of like monitoring what's going on by taking a peek without being noticed trying because if you get noticed then they might come after you now at the time this was just simply heavy d simply looking for dylan rounds and the surrounding area but would, heavy, uh, would James Brennan know at the time? Probably not. So I would say that because of that door being slightly open, that Brenner was minding his own business for the most part of it, though he did take a bit of a peek, sneaky look outside to see what was up. That he didn't want to get out of the trailer to expose himself in view because he would be captured. Then again, he wouldn't know that he's being recorded, but you get what I'm saying? Hopefully that makes sense. I mean, even when you got those islands, tribes, uncontacted, you get helicopter flying on over, all the tribes come running out onto the butt, onto the beach, or just simply looking up in the open space to see what's happening, because they're interested, they're intrigued. Maybe there's more intrigue there because I've never seen anything like that before. Maybe that's the difference. But I think just in general, if you hear something strange or see something interesting, you're going to take a look, even if it means standing out in the open, to be peeking through the window. It's kind of like when you see the films and the movies, right? Police calling by at a business, someone trying to hide inside, take a look through the window. Who is it? Is it the police? Yes, no. Is it a contact? Can't really tell. Sneaky behaviour equals suspicious behavior that's what i'd say let me know your thoughts down below right so all in all maybe this video was shorter than usual but it was a focused one specifically on one or two things hopefully you were able to pick up on it be sure to leave your additional comments and thoughts down below as well as comments feel free to check the other links out if you need to catch up on previous videos and check out other areas and aspects so um yeah Hope you enjoyed the video all in all. As for next time round, it'll probably be another short one. We'll be looking back at the documentary once again, clearing up the misinformation, just documenting that. That will definitely be a shorter one, but, you know, focused, important videos, it is what it is, right? I mean, I could add on to that one, but maybe nothing funny because 
of it being serious. I'm going to tell a serious tone inside of the story. Start joking about the credibility is lost. So yeah, the next video will be serious but short, right? And I guess if there is time, which there probably will be, do some kind of live stream tonight, but it won't be too long, okay? Just because of uh, timing and everything. So we'll leave it there for now. I'll see you next time. For now, goodbye and good night.